Good morning. We are continuing our studies in the gospel. I threw myself off. That was a few months back. Uh, in the book of Colossians, and we're in chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 12 through 17. This is the uh, application part of the book. Paul develops the doctrinal part in the first two chapters, but even here, as he is applying things, as he's drawing the implications from the doctrinal uh, issues that he has uh, explained, can't quite get away from doctrine altogether. And so we do have a very doctrinally oriented passage of Scripture. Paul begins in verse 12, so, and in saying that, he's drawing an implication out from the things that he has already said. So, as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through Him to God the Father. May the Lord bless this reading of His Word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow in prayer. Augustine was an African and the greatest Christian theologian of the first millennium of the church. The reformers, Luther, Calvin, and the others stood on Augustine's shoulders. In one of his sermons on 1 John 4, verses 4 through 12, he said, Love and do what you please. Now, on the face of it, that's surprising almost shocking. Do what you please. But he went on to say, let love be within, for of this root can nothing come except that which is good. In other words, what is done from love, true love, biblical love, will be righteous. That's true. And that's really the instruction that Paul gives in Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17, where he continues to give moral teaching on how the Christian is to behave. He's told the Colossians that they are new creatures. The old self is dead. And so they were to stop living the old life with its vices like anger, wrath, and lying. They're finished with that. Now in verse 12, he gives the positive side of that counsel. It's it's not enough to not do. It's not enough to lay aside bad things. They must also put on what is right and good. Paul begins, so. That is, because uh, you are new people, live like it. Be righteous. So as those who have been chosen of God put on a heart of compassion. In other words, you're the elect of God. So behave like it. Act like a chosen one. And that means act with love. He then lists virtues to be lived. It, uh, but it all culminates in verse 14... Beyond all these things, put on love. Well, there's nothing surprising in that. No one is against love. What is surprising, at least to some, is the standard Paul gives for love. Divine election. In fact, on the face of it, Paul's statement to have compassion and love like the elect 
like those chosen of God is as as shocking as Augustine's statement, love and do what you please. It, it, It is surprising, it is shocking because some believe, they think when they hear something like that, what can be less loving than the doctrine of election? The idea that God excludes people or, and cares only for a very few people and damns the rest. It's all part of that notion of predestination. Even as great a man as John Wesley spoke of the blasphemy and the horrible decree of predestination. Predestination, election, is a stumbling block for many people. And so, for many Christians, actually, they'd all agree with Wesley's description of it. Not Paul, just the opposite. It's not the horrible decree, but the glorious decree. It is an act of God's infinite and unconditional love. It doesn't exclude, it includes. In fact, the more we understand God's choice of sinners to be his people, the more we understand God's grace and mercy and love. In fact, you cannot understand God's love apart from divine election. So I'm going to spend a moment on that subject. Who are the elect? Who are they? The beautiful? The smart? The rich and noble, the the worthy, is that who God set His love upon? Those who deserve His love? No, just the opposite. And it's good to know that. It's necessary to know that. Paul had to remind the Corinthians of that in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 26. Right at the beginning of the book, he reminds them of that fact. Consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. So Paul felt the need to begin his letter to the Corinthians by reminding them of who they were. Fools in the eyes of the world. Weak things whose choice by God was made to shame the wise of the world and the strong of the world. They needed to know that because the Corinthians suffered from a problem that we all have, one of pride, self-importance. And all of this was leading up to Paul's correction of them in chapter 4 and verse 7, where he asked the question, who regards you as superior? Well, the fact of the matter is they did. They thought pretty highly of themselves. And so Paul asked, what do you have that you did not receive? And I don't know what their immediate response to that would have been, but I can imagine, well, there's a lot that I haven't received. There's a lot that I have done, but the point of the question is nothing. There isn't anything that you have that you haven't received. And he goes on, if you did receive it, which you did, why do you boast as if you had not received it? Why do you boast as though this is all your work when it's not? Look, if something is a gift, there's nothing to boast about especially if if the gift is undeserved. And so Paul needed to remind them from the beginning of what we might call an inconvenient truth, and that is they, we, are not worthy, period. It's good to remember where we came from. Isaiah reminded Israel of where they came from. He said in Isaiah 51, verse 1, I'm I'm quoting the King James Version, Look to the rock from which ye are hewn, the pit from which ye are digged. Look unto Abraham. Abraham's the source. Look to him. God chose, and what you'll find as you look to him, he's saying, is God chose a pagan to be the patriarch of his people Israel. Abraham and Sarah were living in ungodly Ur. They were living in the heart of darkness and in idolatry when God called them out. Abraham wasn't worthy. No one is worthy. There is no room 
for pride or a sense of entitlement in election. Just the opposite. God chose the lost. God chose the dead. That's what Paul told the Ephesians. Begins the second chapter of his book by reminding them of that. You were dead in your transgressions and sins. And not just you, all of us. He goes on to include himself and all of us because he says, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh. But he said, God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead, made us alive together with Christ. Now, all of that together is you were dead, but God made you alive. It's God's work. It's all God's work. It's all a gift. What do you have that you've not received? Nothing. He chose us not because we were attractive or worthy, because we merited it, We did not, we were not any of those nice things. He chose us because he loved us. Now, why he loved us with what Paul called his great love, he doesn't say. We just know it wasn't anything in us that merited that love. It's because that's the nature of his love. And because that is the case, his love is great. Great because we were so undeserving of it. He had mercy. That's what Paul said in Romans chapter 9 and verse 16. It does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs. It does not depend on your thinking or your activity, your motives or your deeds. It does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. His love is unconditional. If it had not been for that, Not one of us would have been saved. Election does not exclude people. It includes people. Without it, we all would have been justly, righteously left in our fallen and doomed condition. But God elected some. Not all. Some. He chose out of a fallen, guilty race a people for himself. Not everyone, but not a few. In fact, a lot. In fact, a vast multitude he chose to believe and be saved. He gave them to his son to redeem by his death, and and then they sent the Holy Spirit to gather the elect, to apply the blessings of the cross to them and bring them to faith in Christ. And he continues to do that. He's doing that today, tomorrow, In every day of every generation, he is gathering his vast number of people, his elect. That's the love of God's election. It's undeserved. Look to the pit from which ye are digged. And if you look with clear eyes, you'll see that pit is deep and dark. Really, unconditional election is not the horrible decree. It is the humbling decree. It ensures that we would be lifted from that deep, dark pit and redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Now, Paul was saying, we are like that. As those who have been chosen of God, who are beloved of God, shown great mercy, be that way, be the same to others. So if you're wondering, am I of the elect? Well, ask yourself, do you believe? Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Are you trusting in him alone for your salvation? The elect do that. They're chosen to believe. And do you love? Do you love one another? That, too, is what the elect do. That's what Paul goes on to say. He says, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Earlier, he told them, put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice. Now, he says, put on compassion. It's the the picture of taking off filthy rags and putting on clean clothes. 
I've heard when a man is released from prison, he's given a new suit. I don't know if that's the case or if that's still done, but that's a good picture. Because what it pictures is a man taking off the prison clothes and putting on civilian clothes. And really, that's, that's us. Quit wearing the uniform of the old life, Paul is saying, and put on the new suit of righteousness, which we are in Christ, declared righteous. It's a life of compassion and caring. It's a life of forgiveness. It's a life of uh, giving help. That's what he's saying. Put that on. A life of compassion and caring. The virtues that Paul lists here, all, all of them, each one of them, worthy of a sermon. They are the virtues that characterize the life of Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 11, and verse 29, he described himself as being gentle and humble in heart. If the Son of God could humble himself to become a man in order to serve us and even die for us, what should we then be? Who are by nature rebels, who are by nature guilty of sin and saved only by God's mercy, his sovereign grace? What kind of people should we be? Well, we should be people like our Lord. We should be people... Uh, like those Paul describes in Philippians chapter 2, verse, verse 4, which is he's applying to all of us. He's telling us all there how we are to live. Don't look out only for your own personal interests, but look out chiefly for the interests of others. We should have the attitude in us that is in Jesus Christ, and the attitude that was in him is that of a servant. Compassion comes out of knowing who we once were and all that our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, did for us. Compassion is a deeply felt desire of mercy and act of kindness. How different that is from the world, which is not compassionate, but callous and cruel. It's a realm governed by self-interest and the rule, every man for himself and the devil take the hindmost. The church is compassionate, merciful. So we are to behave in such a way in even the smallest matters, the, the smallest personal relationships that we have. Really, that's, that's, that's it, especially in the relationships that we have, the most minor aspects of those relationships, we're to behave in this way. That, that's, and, and it's really in the relationships of life that Paul is speaking here. We of all people are to beware of being hard and censorious, critical, self-righteous people. After what we've experienced, to do that would be hypocritical. We're to be kind, we're to be helpful, we're to be generous and patient. And patience, long-suffering, which ends verse 12, is what is required to do what Paul counsels next in verse 13 when he says we are to be bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also, so also should you. Forgiveness is an easy, easy thing to preach. It's a difficult thing to practice. Then, uh, well, really, which of these virtues isn't difficult to practice? But uh, certainly forgiveness. Vengeance is uh, in the nature of man. That is, in the nature of fallen man, the natural man. It's the human response to a wrong suffered. You see that all through the, uh, the Bible. You see it all through the Old Testament. In fact, one of the, the characteristics of the Bible that, in my mind, is uh, an evidence of the veracity of it, the truth of it, is it, it fits reality. It doesn't read like myth. It fits the way things are. We read what took place 
2,000, 3,000 years ago, and we see it happening in our own day, in our own hearts. But you see that in regard to vengeance. You see it practiced throughout. Um, things like Joab. What a great example of that is he who murdered Abner for the death of his brother. Blood feuds and honor killings are not uncommon in the world. Christians are different. Christians are to forgive. And we have the standard that encourages that response when everything in us says strike, we have the standard to do something different. Just the opposite. And that standard is grace as it's seen in, in unconditional election and in Christ in what he, who He is and what He has done for us. Forgive just as the Lord forgave you. How can we not do that when He has forgiven so much, forgiven everything, forgiven far more than you and I will ever have to forgive in someone else? This is why doctrine is, is so important. And I would say, just as a parenthesis, how can we, how can we not forgive? Well, we still struggle as believers. So how can we, how can we have this attitude of forgiveness and, and carrying out all these virtues? Only by the grace of God. Only by the sovereign grace of God. But there are things we do, and one of the essential things we do to produce a heart of forgiveness is studying the Word of God and considering the great truths that he set forth here, the doctrines that he set forth here. And so that's why I say doctrine is so important. It is essential that we understand the doctrines of the Christian faith. We need to know God. We need to know ourselves. That's how we learn about these things. But all of the doctrines of the Word of God are eminently practical. They're practical because they are the basis for our actions. Uh, Scott, that I have quoted more than once, Thomas Erskine, put it very simply. Religion is grace. Ethics is gratitude. When you understand the doctrine of grace, which we're really studying here, the natural response is gratitude. And so you behave in the right way out of a sense of thanksgiving for all that the Lord has done. The love of God for us inspires love in us for Him and for others. And all of these virtues are expressions of love. So Augustine was right. Love and do what you please. That is really what Paul says next in verse 14. Beyond all these things, put on love. The King James has, above all these things, put on love. Beyond, above, put on love. The idea of that is literally on top of all of the other, that is the other virtues, or to continue with the image he's using, on top of all of the other items of clothing, put on love. It is the, the crowning grace of it all. In Galatians 5, verse 22, Paul lists nine graces that are similar to those listed here. He, he calls them the fruit of the Spirit. The word fruit is singular. He doesn't say fruits of the Spirit, though he lists uh, nine virtues of, of that. But fruit, because... Uh, that all nine are a unity. They go together. They can't be separated. I don't know what image he had in mind. Perhaps a cluster of grapes, a unity, but there is uh, parts to it. And, and they all go together. So not just some of these are to be found in us. All of them are to be found in us. In Galatians, the, the first grace that's listed is love. It's on top. And in Colossians, love is chief. Above all, love. It is the bond of unity, Paul says. It binds together all of these graces, all of these virtues, and it is the impetus for us doing 
kindness or for, for behaving in the proper way with humility and patience. But it is what binds Christians together as well personally and enables them to rise above their differences and stay united in their relationship because love is giving, not emotive. Now, I don't mean to suggest that love has no sense of a feeling in it and there's no emotion connected with love. I think if one truly loves someone, they, they will have a sense of emotion. But essentially, love is active. And essentially, love is selfless and sacrificial. Unity was Paul's great concern for the church because it's so easily broken. And where a church is divided, it is weak. And it is in danger of dissolving or becoming irrelevant. So, above all, love. Now, Paul's concern for unity is given in the next verse. <clears throat> verse 15, when he moves from love to peace. But still, love is the impetus. Love is the driving force for that. So he says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Christians have been called to peace. It is what Christ established between believers and God. That's Romans chapter 5, verse 1. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. A hundred years ago today, the great war ended. It was the war to end all wars. On the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. We call it World War I because it didn't end all wars. It was followed by World War II, which was really just a continuation of it. The reality is man cannot end all wars. Man cannot end war. Man cannot establish peace. It's not in him to do it. I'm reading a book titled uh, Six Days of War by Michael Orne. It's about the six-day war that Israel fought in 1967. They fought Egypt, Jordan, Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon. And in six days, they wiped them all out. Destroyed their air force. Gathered lots of armaments, tanks, and ammunition. They tripled the size of their territory. In six days... They became, it would seem, invulnerable, and all of those Arab states that had threatened them became vulnerable to them. It was an amazing thing. And you would think from that, all that they gained, they had peace. And they thought they did, no doubt, for years to come. And yet, just a few years later, they had the Yom Kippur War. And on Yom Kippur, the Syrians and the Egyptians attacked and almost overran Israel, and so it has gone. There's no peace there. That was the call of the false prophets throughout the book of Jeremiah. Peace, peace, but there is no peace. There'll never be peace in this world because man cannot establish that. But God has done that. God has ended the greatest war, the oldest war, the war between himself and man, and he's done that through his son. The war is over for everyone who is a believer in Jesus Christ. We were formerly enemies of God. Now we are friends. Christ has reconciled us to God. He has made us God's sons and daughters. We live in harmony with Him. That harmony between believers and God must also exist between believers and believers. It's, it's to rule the church, Paul says. We can't be at peace with God and be at war with each other. Now that happens, unfortunately. Because while we are a new creation in Christ, we still have a lot of the old life in us. And we are easily offended. We are easily set against each other. The, for, the reformers were right when they said, 
that we are righteous in Christ, but what we are is righteous sinners, declared righteous and legally righteous with God, but we still struggle with the sin that's within us. So we're set against each other. Again, the, the, the church can't function like that. It is crippled by disunity. We are a body, Paul says here in verse 15. And that is a metaphor that he uses throughout his writings to describe the church. We are a body, and a body can only function well when its various and many parts are in harmony with, with each other. Just think of the human body, how complex it is, how many parts it has, large parts and small parts, and all of it in a healthy body work in harmony. Now, that is a work of the common grace of God that He gives that to us. But how much that illustrates the reality within the body of Christ, we need the grace of God for that to happen. It's vitally important for that to happen. But we are to do things to, in our responsibility, and that's what Paul is urging here. And he urges it with some uh, urgency. He says, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. That word rule also means arbitrate. Let peace be an umpire between us and guide our relationships. Peace is active. We, we only see half of it when we see peace in a, a, uh, a, a passive sense, in the sense of peace as the absence of war, the absence of conflict. Well, that's peace, that's true. But that's not really the sense of peace in the Bible. The, the Hebrew word for peace is familiar to all of you, shalom. And what that means is not just the absence of hostility, but it means it, it is something positive. It speaks of, of welfare, of, uh, of well-being. And it is both together, a, a cessation of hostility and a promotion of well-being. We're to produce that. Peace is to rule in our hearts. Goal of uh, preventing uh, hostility and division and promoting well-being among believers. That's what peace is to produce. And, and it begins in our own hearts individually. So we're not to magnify our personal ambitions. Nothing wrong with having ambition in the sense of having goals for your life and striving to, for excellency, but never at the cost of someone else. Never do we run over someone in order to gain our own our own uh, advancement. We're not to seek our own ends and desires above that of other people. We're to be humble. That's the prescri prescription Paul gives in Philippians chapter 2. That's how we serve as Christ did, who humbled himself to become our sacrifice. We're to do the same. And then God's blessings flow through us like clean water through a pipe. A pipe is what you are. That's an analogy that uh, William Still gave, a Scottish minister of about a generation ago. He likened us to a pipe. And he, he said, a pipe doesn't function standing on end, so it's seen. It doesn't have any function at all like that. It functions when it's laid in the dirt, covered over, and water flows through it. That's how we get water. And we, we are rare, rarely aware of the pipes, but we are grateful for them. That's how we are to live. It, it encourages peace in a congregation. And what encourages peace in us and allows, us to, allows it to rule in our hearts is knowing that we have peace with God by the grace of God. We're under His protection and guidance. He will give us everything we need and more when we forget about ourselves and live for Him and His purpose. As we do that, He provides for us. He doesn't neglect us. He may not provide for us in quite the way we want, but He'll provide for us in the best way. And that establishes peace in our hearts, knowing that He's in control. So also does this next statement that Paul makes. 
be thankful. How can we be thankful for all that God has given to us and all that we know He will give us? In fact, what we know about what He will give us is we don't know a fraction of the greatness of it. But how can we, knowing all of this, debtors to mercy alone, recipients of His grace and His abundance, and how can we then be angry with each other with all of that in mind? In Matthew 18, Jesus told the story of a king who forgave a man an impossible debt, 10,000 talents. Now, I read that and I'm not sure what it, I guess that's a lot, but what, what are 10,000 talents? And so one of the versions of the New Inter International Version translated that, 10,000 bags of gold. The, the point is, it was a, a sum that he could never repay. But the king had mercy on him. He begged for mercy and the king felt compassion and forgave the debt. What did the man do? Well, he went out immediately and found a man who owed him a hundred silver coins, a pittance compared to what he had owed. He had the man thrown in jail for not repaying it to him. When the king learned of it, he was furious. He handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay it all back. The point is, we who have been forgiven so much by God should forgive our brothers and sisters, or we're not worthy. Look to the pit from which you were digged, Isaiah said. Consider the kind of people you were and what God has done for you. That should produce gratitude. And those who are grateful, they really are grateful and understand what they've received. They can't be angry or spiteful. They will let peace rule in their hearts and be united with their brothers and sisters. They will, above all, love. That leads Paul to another command, which I think he comes to naturally from everything he has just said. He tells the Colossians to let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. Now, does Paul mean within you individually or collectively? That is, as, as a church, as the body of Christ, or is this personally? Well, both make sense and both are important. Uh, if it doesn't dwell in the individual, if the Word of God isn't dwelling within us, then it won't dwell within the church. But from the context and from his concern for the church as the body, as he has described it in verse 15, I think what is most on Paul's mind here is this collective idea of the church. Be a church that is devoted to the study of the Bible. That's what he's saying. The meeting of the church should be structured around teaching. The teaching of the Word of God. That, that cannot be emphasized enough. And notice, it is the Word of Christ. That is, Scripture proceeds from Him. The Word of God is His Word, Christ's Word, because He is God. He is the Son of God. And so as we hear it and submit to it, we are yielding ourselves to the authority of Christ. We are doing what Christ would do and would have us to do. And as we yield ourselves to the Word of Christ, He transforms us, He conforms us to His image, so that we are like Him. He desires us to do that. His, because His then desires become our desires. His Word dwells in each of us and then the church so that uh, there is unity and harmony among us. The teaching of Scripture does that. The teaching of Scripture is vital for that. The teaching of Scripture feeds our souls. That is principally what the church is to do and be, a place where the Bible is taught. Again, everything centers around it. In 1 Timothy chapter five, uh, rather chapter 3 and verse 15, Paul calls the church the pillar and support of the truth. Now that's not all that the church is. 
But first of all, it is the pillar and support of the truth. That's what we're to be doing, supporting the truth and promoting the truth. Again, it's not all that the church is. It's not only a place to come and hear a sermon. The church is a body. It is a living thing of saints drawn together in a community for mutual blessing and service to each other. We, we are bound together to help each other grow in knowledge and wisdom so that we live to God's glory. That's our chief end to do that and enjoy Him properly, personally. And, and bless one another and ultimately bless the world as we give light to the world. That's, that's clear from what Paul says next. The result will be with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. That's what happens when the Word of God is the center of the life of the church. There is wise instruction, tactful instruction, clear instruction. Truth is applied appropriately with correction and encouragement. That's to take place. Now that doesn't come from the pulpit only. It also comes from the pew. Paul is describing the church and how the members of the body are to minister to each other and worship the Lord. Worship is important. Congregational singing is an expression of a church's vitality. And, and if it's done properly, it, it's not forced or manipulated. It is natural. It is what naturally springs from a grateful heart. We sing from thankfulness in your hearts to God, Paul says. In Ephesians 5 verse 19, Paul gives similar instruction. Singing was um, clearly an important part of the church service. It was intended to edify the body. Singing was intended to guide in praising the Lord, to give us direction in that, and all according to the truth of Scripture. Hymns aren't any good if they, if they aren't biblical, and so they are to be an expression of the truth of Scripture. In Ephesians 5 and verse 19, the statement is, making melody with your heart to the Lord, referring to Christ. So here, in your hearts to God has the same meaning, recognizing that Christ is no less than God. He's God the Son, equal with the Father in essence and power and glory. And it is melody and psalms that arise out of gratitude for all that He has done for us. The more we understand that, the more we understand His grace and His love, the more we will love Him and the more we will sing. Song is a means God has given to express our love for Him. And who doesn't enjoy hymns that magnify the Lord God and His glory? Hymns like Amazing Grace and A Mighty Fortress. In fact, when the light of God's Word shines out, God's people sing. It was the reformers who rediscovered Paul that reintroduced congregational singing into churches. All of this is the result of the teaching of God's Word. It's the consequence of believing it and responding to it. We care for each other and we seek to build each other up in Christ, to be like Christ as the Word of God dwells within us. The Word of God is living and active, the author of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 4, verse 12. And as a living thing, it produces life within us, and it produces life-changing results in us. And what Paul is describing here is what all of that looks like. Never dismiss or depreciate the teaching of the Word of God. Now, that's essential because the Word of God is Christ's Word to us. The sermon isn't the Word of God. The sermon isn't Christ's Word to you. 
but sermons and lessons are necessary to explain the Word of God, which is God's Word to us, His inerrant Word, the Word of Christ. And so we are to be submissive to it. We are not to be dismissive of it. We are to pay attention. That's why Paul states this command, let the Word of Christ richly dwell in you. Richly. What's that mean? Well, abundantly. The Word of God should, should dwell lavishly within us because it unlocks the treasures of the faith for your life. Love and joy and peace and all of these things. Don't deprive yourself of that, that wealth personally and also as a church. Finally, Paul sums up all of this instruction in verse 17. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through Him to God the Father. That is the general rule of the Christian life. The New Testament doesn't lay out a detailed code of, of rules that govern every aspect of our lives as the law of Moses did for Israel. I mean, it was very particular in all the things, dress and diet and whatever. What the New Testament does give is general principles that are to be applied to various situations as they arrive. And that will be done as we understand the principles of the New Testament uh, and, and as we wisely look at life and apply them according to the leading of the Holy Spirit. All of that works together. Now, nine of the Ten Commandments have been repeated in the New Testament, and they are inflexible rules. And all of the principles of righteousness are inflexible rules. But many of these areas are, are, are governed, as I say, by these general principles. Does my behavior honor Christ? We need to ask ourselves that. Can I, can I do this in His name? Is my behavior a response of thankfulness for His grace? This is how we approach the issues of life. If we do those things that put the Lord first and do all that we do to His glory and not for our pleasure, if we seek Him first, then we will not make a mistake. We will love as Christ loved, which is sacrificially. Christ said, greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. He has done that. Once for all, the just for the unjust, the righteous for the unrighteous, you are His friend if you believe in Him. If you have not believed, recognize your need, that you're a sinner. The warfare is not ended. His death alone ends that. His death alone wipes away all of the sin and guilt of all those who believe in Him. So believe in Him. Come to Him. Live for Him as a new creation. How? As Paul has said, above all, put on love. And as Augustine counseled, love and do what you please. Because if you love, you will do no harm. You will only bless and you'll bring glory to God. God help us all to do that. It's over time. Nevertheless, let's stand and sing one of the great hymns in that white book. Number 48. Oh, the love of my Redeemer, and then remain standing for the benediction. Father, what we have studied this morning is really your love for us. We cannot begin to fathom it, even when we sing it. It doesn't do justice. Thank you for all you've done for us. May we live as men and women who love to your glory. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.